Oh. All right, but Tom's going to get us started on this next session. So if everyone can just take their seats. And then, Tom, I'm going to hand it off to you. All right, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I just wanted to uh, make a quick point uh, before I started about um, the last speaker. I was very impressed his ability to listen and, and own up to things. That, I'd also like to say, based on my experience in other base states, uh, and this is just my own private opinion, but I expressed it to someone else. Um, EPA is auditing folks around the watershed, uh, as you well know, and that is makes a lot of people lose sleep. But they're doing it primarily in other states, as well as Pennsylvania, because those states <coughs> were never taking, you know, evaluating the MS4 permits that they were receiving and not doing the on-site inspection. So they went over to the state's heads in Virginia, in Maryland, and other communities uh, simply to compel the states to do what their Clean Water Act responsibility is. And so I think as time goes forward, my prediction is that uh, the kind of EPA as the IRS will fade away and it'll be more of a constructive relationship between DEP and your MS4 on how you can improve it, and you'll have the responsibility to show that you've got a credible program, but I don't think the day of the timestamp file, you know, hopefully that might um, disappear. So that's just my own private projection, but uh, having seen the what's happened in Virginia and Maryland, I think that you know, EPA will probably back off in the next couple of years. So, having said that, um, we'll get down to things you can do on the ground. In this session, Cecilia, uh, who's the stormwater coordinator at CSN, will put together. Uh, we have, in terms of materials, uh, two items up on the website. Uh, one is a document called Bioretention Illustrated, um, which goes over the uh, visual indicator approach. And then there's this terrifying but very colorful uh, flow chart, which we were given. And we'll be going over that uh, in the presentation. But one of the things we do at CSN is we try to understand what MS4s need and then try to give them some tools to do it. Um, so what we're going to uh, discuss is I'll have a couple quick slides on why maintenance matters. Cecilia will talk over the visual indicators approach and explain the flowchart. We'll use a case study uh, for bioretention on what the indicators are and how to get people to see it. Uh, and then the more sophisticated forensic investigations for facilities that fail. Uh, then uh, I think I'll deal with visual indicators for other practices. Is that? So it's a lot to go over before lunch, but uh, uh, I wanted to start out with, you know, maintenance can be very sexy, um, yeah, but most people don't consider it so. Uh, but the real goal that we have here is to get people to see very quickly when a practice is doing fine or when a practice is not doing fine. If it's not doing fine, what maintenance they have to do. And for, uh, uh, so we've been doing training programs for what, two or three years now uh, in a 15 different counties and cities across the watershed. We've probably looked at few hundred different practices out in the field to get that sense. And we've taken so many digital photos, um, I can't even tell you. But the big change that's happened for us is uh, we've made a major shift in how we manage stormwater, as all of you know. We've, our old uh, model was to have one centralized uh, facility, usually a big detention pond, at the bottom of the development and, and treat it all in one place. And so from a maintenance standpoint, what we used to do, we used to do is we kind of drive 
down close to it, have a couple donuts, maybe a cup of coffee, uh, unless we work for DEP, then it would be a gift. Uh, and then we do about an hour or two inspection, and we a um, big checklist. We look at the barrel, the riser, the emergency spillway, and we would uh, evaluate it for what? To prevent catastrophe. And we, we don't want a dam failure. And the purpose of that was you know, if, you, if the big embankment fails during a storm, there's a liability to the community to do so. That was really the objective of our old uh, model. Uh, we've shifted now to this distributed approach to stormwater management where we might have you know, uh, disconnections on individual rooftops, swales, rain gardens, bigger bioretention areas, tree planting, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, so now we have many tiny BMPs. And so the first reaction of the most communities is, how the heck are we going to maintain this? How the heck are we going to inspect it? Because if we use the same approach of a two-hour inspection and we now have um, 40 practices, you know, we can do the math in our head and say, our inspectors will never come home. So that was really the challenge. I mean, a lot more practices to deal with. We now have more prescriptive requirements from EPA and DEP to do those maintenance inspections. Uh, I won't spend a lot of time today over the verification requirements for the Bay TMDL, but the big thing we know is that we're never going to hire any more staff, and we're going to have to do it with our existing resources. So Cecilia and I and a, a colleague that we really respect a lot, Ted Scott, uh, kind of confronted this issue and uh, developed a system of uh, visual indicators. We did it because as a network, we have over 7,500 people uh, that belong to the Chesapeake Stormwater Network. And I encourage you all as well. It's free, and all you get is an occasional email from Cecilia about the latest thing that's been developed. But we do a survey uh, every year, every other year usually, about what's the biggest obstacle, um, <coughs> what the training preferences are. This is just one of the uh, survey results, but you know, no matter whether you're a big county in Maryland, whether you're a city in Virginia or a hamlet in Pennsylvania, the number one concern is always maintenance. <coughs> How are we going to maintain them? What is maintenance? And with all these things like rain gardens, what, what are the tasks that we do? Uh, and so it's a, a big change. And so uh, I'll turn it over to Cecilia to go over the visual indicator approach. But I'll just end on this slide. Um, the goal is can, how can we evaluate these smaller practices in 10 minutes or less? Um, and the way to do so is to follow a prescribed sequence to assess the functionality of the practice by looking at numeric triggers. Um, so it's kind of the ability to look at the sequence of indicators to go past minor, moderate, or severe. And the idea is we can use a phone or a tablet in the field to do the scores, uh, and then we create a maintenance punch list if we need it. And it can be done. I think this is important. Our previous pond maintenance model, we had to have a, because of liability reasons, we needed to have a professional engineer or at least a highly trained engineer. <coughs> this visual indicators approach, you can train your staff or even high school or summer interns to do in a, a week's time or less. And so you can essentially do the inspection at a cheaper rate than you've done before. So I'll turn it over to Cecilia to describe the process and uh, also introduce herself. Okay. okay. So I guess this sound thing is working. Okay. So as Tom said, I'm Cecilia Lane. I'm the stormwater coordinator for the Chesapeake Stormwater Network. Um, just a quick intro about me. Some of the things I do, I work with Tom and his work at the Bay Program to help determine the different credits you get for using different restoration 
um, techniques towards meeting the Bay and local TMDLs. I work on the Chesapeake Bay Stormwater Training Partnership to bring you this training. I help develop content and then provide the trainings. I do a lot of webcasts. And then I also manage our network, which I think you undersold a little bit. But we have about 7,500 members. It's free to join, and it's really email blasts about new technical resources that you can use or other templates that we have available on our websites, upcoming free webcasts that we're offering. So all you do is join, and I think it's like twice a month, that's my goal, twice a month to email you about new resources. So if you want it, it's there. Um, I think Tom's kind of go, gone over the need for a visual approach to inspection. You know, we've talked about how you need an engine, you used to need an engineer for a wet pond and it was really a matter of liability and it was a long thing. So if we're going to increase the number of practices that we're putting in the ground from 200 to 5,000, we're not going to have the staff or resources to inspect them all at that um, level and not all of the rain gardens need to be inspected by an engineer for two hours with a 30 page checklist. So um, that's why we came up with the visual approach to be able to do a rapid assessment. Um, it's something that I think is really important and I'll get to in a little bit is just the need to integrate technology through the inspection process um, because that'll make it a little bit faster as well. But I'll, I'll get into that. So again, Tom was talking a little bit about how we developed this technical bulletin called um, Bioretention Illustrated. And I'm going to take you through it step by step today using bioretention as an example. This is available as one of the resources on your website. Yes, Donna, is this on the website, this technical bulletin? Yes. So people can download it, but I just want to draw your attention to how it's very visual in nature. And then we assigned numeric triggers, and this become more apparent as I get into it. But we assign numeric triggers so you can assess a practice. Like, is it is it operating as it's supposed to? Is it functioning? Is it is it messed up and we need to do something about it? Or is it, um, you know, maybe it just needs a little bit of routine maintenance before we move on. Based on this document and then what we'll talk about, we also put together with our friends um, an inspection app that is free to download that you can use. Again, it's only been developed for bioretention, but it takes you step by step through each of the visual indicators and prompts you, like you're looking at the inlet condition. Is it a good, is it a pass, is it not so good, is it a fail? And you can take a picture using your smartphone or tablet and upload it immediately. The final byproduct is a PDF form that can be filed as part of your you know, inspection procedure and then can be used for record keeping. So that's available on the website. And I think I put together a list of resources at the end. Um, so now I'm going to take you through the visual indicator approach. And I think Tom kind of got to this, but it's a triage approach. You're looking very rapidly to say, yes, this practice works, I can move on. Or um, there needs to be some routine maintenance happening at this practice on a more regular basis. So we need to deal with that. But that's a quick fix. Or, wow, this practice is like failing and we need someone with a little bit more experience to come out and spend some more time and investigate why this practice is failing. So it's all based off of this really scary flow chart, which you all got a copy of because it's impossible to read on the screen. But um, basically the idea is that you can use a visual inspection approach at every stage in the inspection process. So beginning at construction inspection, um, project acceptance, routine maintenance, and routine inspection, the green and red roads with their columns, which is what we're going to be really focusing on today. And then during performance verification, which can be piggybacked on to regular routine inspection. Um, you can also use it when you're inspecting your legacy BMPs and creating your BMP inventory. And so that's the idea, is that this visual approach can be used every <coughs> step of the way. Um, and then as you can see, we talk about what's the objective of this particular inspection, who's the audience of the inspection, how often should it happen, and you can see obviously one to two times during construction, it only really happens once during project um, acceptance, routine maintenance, it happens about two to four, time, two to four times a year because that's when the practice is being maintained. Routine inspection is for your permit, so that's once any one to five years based on what the permits require. And then the performance verification, that's for the Bay TMDL requirements. And that's where we said, where Tom said earlier, you have a practice and it gets a credit for five years. Well, if you want to get it for another five years, it needs to go through that performance verification. 
which just simply says, is the practice, does it still exist? Um, is it still functioning as designed? And what's the third component to it? That's basically it. it, does it is it working? Is it removing pollutants? Now, again, I kind of alluded to this. It's a rapid inspection, but when, it, when you find a practice that's relatively um, struggling, you can, go, <laughs> you can go to what we call a forensic BMP investigation, or an FBI, and that's where you kind of say, all right, this practice needs more attention, but I don't have time for this now. Or maybe whoever's doing the rapid inspection doesn't have the technical ability, so we'll send out an engineer to spend some serious time investigating the area. So we'll go through that a little bit more. So again, today we're going to focus on this routine regulatory inspection stage. So you're inspecting this in order to meet your MS4 requirements. MS4 permit requirements. So what are we looking to do to ensure that the BMP is properly maintained and functioning and develop a punch list of what needs to happen um, in order to make sure it, that it continues to function as designed. Again, we're doing it to meet our MS4 permit requirements. It happens, you know, the frequency is dictated by the permit. And the skill level, we're arguing, is not necessarily an engineer, a very costly engineer, but someone who has been trained in this approach. And as Tom said, it could be a summer intern. Um, so the tool that we're going to use is this visual indicators approach. And the one thing I'll say is while we, I'm going to go through and talk through the different components, um, we assigned numeric triggers in the document, but that can be revised based on a community's needs. You know, if you don't, if you feel that the numeric triggers are a little bit different for you, then you can revise it. All of the stuff that we produce is available on our website for free for you to download and then edit to meet your own needs. So I know Mike said that was really important. You can use something as a starting point, but you really have to adapt it to have your municipality specific stuff in there. So when you're doing a field investigation, um, if it's okay with you, I can just ditch the microphone. Yeah, that's sure. fine. I'm sorry. Okay. It's distracting you. I just, I think I can project in this room. Mm -hmm. But speak up if I'm not loud enough. So during our field investigations, what we hope to achieve, what we're trying to do, is we're going to take a lot of photos. Like Tom said, we have a ton of photos in our office of different BMPs in the field. And sometimes you're like, is that even a BMP? Um, you're taking measurements and notes. Some of our colleagues who, we help, who helped us develop this visual indicators approach have a great technique, which is they bring a whiteboard with them. So I can't tell you how many pictures of inlets I have seen, and then when I get back to the office, I'm like, this is a picture of an inlet, but I don't remember which inlet. So this is a way that they have of you know, writing the date, writing the name of the facility, writing what you're taking a picture of. So this is what's in the front and foreground of the picture, and then in the background is what you actually took a picture of. So it helps when you're doing your, um, your data sorting back at the office um, and writing a report, your inspection report. Um, so obviously you need a dry erase board to do that. That's a very good approach. And then you need a digital camera. Um, if you do download the inspection app or go that route, you can use your tablet. That's really important. And then just carrying simple tools um, so that you can inspect the facilities, um, which I think I have a picture of. So again, in the upper right hand corner of the screen, that's um, an example of a truck that's been outfitted just for doing these inspections. So it has all sorts of different tools that they use for the different BMPs that they're inspecting. Um, some other things that you might want to take with you. I think we talked about the whiteboard, a manhole pick, obviously, for popping the storm drain um, manholes, digital camera, um, a shovel and a rake, a soil, soil auger if that's necessary. And then some optional items. I mean, I think it really helps the, the field sites that I've been to. It really helps if you have the as built or site plans because sometimes it's hard to locate where that BMP is, especially if it's overgrown. So you can kind of use that to orient yourself and find the BMP. Um, I'm a big fan of safety, so safety vests are really important, and I like bug spray. The six pack of beer, I think Tom might have slipped that into the slide when I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> um, but so I'm going to take you through the approach now, and I, like we said, I'm going to use bioretention as an example. But the visual indicators for the other LID practices have been developed, they're in the document as appendices. There's some discussion about whether we'll make standalone documents for them in the future, and that'll be funding dependent. But I think it's something we hope to do. So, warning this may be the last bio, uh, nice looking bioretention area that you're going to see. 
Um, so what is bioretention? I'm just going to do a quick intro for anyone who doesn't know what that is, just so we understand how it operates, because understanding how it operates really helps in understanding how to inspect it, right? Because we, we've all seen those bioretention that have, they're supposed to have a ponding area, and then they get filled, that gets filled in with mulch. So obviously, whoever's doing the maintenance or the inspection isn't understanding that you really need the ponding area as part of the pollutant removal technique. So some pretty pictures of bio, or different pictures of bioretention. It goes by many names, bioretention, rain garden, water quality swale, and this is a picture of an urban bioretention, so it's kind of built into the sidewalk and it takes water off of the street. So how it works. Basically, water flows into the system and temporarily ponds. So that's what we were just talking about, it needs that ponding area. Then it slowly filters down through the filter bed, and then it's either collected through a pipe and goes back into the storm drain system, or it infiltrates into the surrounding area. So the important things are we need the water to get into the facility, we need the ponding area, we need the filter bed, and then we need the under drain and the other infrastructure that takes the water out, and we really need the, the vegetation. I think one thing that this diagram doesn't really do well is show that some of that water is evapotranspired back into the atmosphere. So those are all the different parts we're going to be looking at. The ponding area, I just said this, the filter media, the pea gravel, which is that layer in between the under drain layer and the filter media area to keep the filter media out from getting into the under drain and clogging it up. And then the under drain, the overflow, the vegetation, and yeah, so the water comes in goes down, ponds and goes down, goes into the underdrain and then goes out that way. Those are the basic parts. So again, Tom mentioned we're gonna go through it in this kind of prescribed sequence. So we will first look at the inlet area, then we're gonna look at the side slopes, we'll get down into the bed of the bioretention, look at the vegetation, and then finally look at the outlet structure. The same way that the water is essentially moving through the system is the way we're gonna take a look at the system. So just one other schematic to show how these different sections have been broken up. And this is the bioretention from above. So for bioretention, we identified 18 individual indicators that you will be investigating. Now, the goal is to do this in 30 minutes or less. So we're not going to do that in 30 minutes or less today because we're going to talk through each one. When you get really good at this, you can essentially run through them because the, and so not all of them apply to every bioretention. So you can see that what we, one thing we did is we took the different visual indicators and assigned them to the different zones that I just showed you earlier. So the first four are in the inlet zone. So they all have to do with water getting into the facility. Um, the next three are in the perimeter zone or the side slope zone. And that's just you know what's happening within the facility itself. We've got the bed zone where we're down into the facility and we're looking at things like uh, bed sinking and the ponding depth, trash, and any erosion that could be happening. Then we really need to look at the vegetation. As we said earlier, these runoff reduction practices are different than the traditional practices because of the vegetation. They get a better pollutant removal rate and they get better runoff reduction, actually removing the water because of the bio aspect of bioretention. So we got to make sure that it's still working, otherwise it's not reducing things the same way. And then we want to take a look at the the infrastructure as well. So uh, I mentioned this earlier, the FBI, the Forensic BMP Investigation. So this is to diagnose why the BMP is not working and how we can fix it. Um, whoever owns it is the audience of this. And again, this is just on an as-needed basis. And we probably need someone a little bit more skilled to get out there. And it's, the goal is, again, to save the more expensive staff to go do that when needed. So let's get into the inspection then. Our first indicator we're gonna look at today is inlet obstruction. And the goal of this is, again, we need that water. I don't know how many of you have seen this. I've seen this a number of times where you've got a practice and the water can't actually get into the practice just the way that it was designed. So we're gonna take a look at the inlet and make sure that the water um, is actually getting in there. The stormwater runoff is actually getting in there. So here's an example of an inlet in pretty good condition so it gets a pass. Right, maybe there's a little bit of maintenance needed. And on the upper right side, and the down here, you can see the minor and moderate, where we've got a little bit more 
Um, either we've got, in this case, we've got a lot of pine needles that are pooling because the, where the parking lot was, there's a bunch of pine trees. They drop all their pine needles. And so it's not a huge thing, but you do need some maintenance here because as that continues to pile up, that will eventually divert the water from getting into the facility. In a moderate um, situation, we've got some sediment that's building up here in this one. And so that could be an indication. So moderate's a little different because it's kind of an indication of bigger problems down the line. But why do we have so much sediment coming to this facility? And this FBI one, you can see, and I apologize, <coughs> I think I kind of covered it up, but over here we've got a huge thing of sediment sitting in the parking lot. So why is that there? I mean, is it coming from, is there a source of sediment in the drainage area? Um, is the water pooling and then it's dropping all the sediment out before it gets in? Is it getting more water than it was originally designed to take? So that's the kind of stuff that is going to need to be investigated during the FBI. Because it's going to take a lot more time. You're going to have to walk the drainage area and kind of compare what you see now to the site plans as, as it was designed. Um, but again, that moderate situation is kind of an indication of this future severe situation. So that's the general approach, and we're going to do that for the, each of the different um, indicators. So again, here's some more examples of a severe inlet obstruction situation. I mean, you can, hopefully you can all see there's a ton of sediment sitting outside of the inlet for this particular facility. And again, some potential options, locate the source of that sediment, sediment and mitigate, you know, whether there's like a construction site in the drainage area. Um, evaluate the need to enhance or provide pretreatment to the facility if the facility doesn't already have pretreatment, and then design remediation as needed. You don't want that kind of sediment getting into your facility. You don't want it sitting outside the inlet. If it gets into the facility, it could clog the filter bed, so it's not going to accept any more water. If it sits outside the facility, it could build up and prevent additional stormwater runoff from getting into the facility. So is that clear, the kind of general approach on how you evaluate each of these practices. All right, the second indicator we're looking at with bioretention is erosion happening at the inlet. So this is when water has already got, is getting into the facility. It's not pooling on the outside, but it's kind of wreaking havoc once it gets in there. So this is an example of a good um, inlet in good condition. On the upper right side, you can see there's runoff coming in sheet flow across the parking lot into the bioretention, and it's moving a bunch of that mulch around. So maybe you can see that from the picture. It's um, <clears throat> not a big deal right now. You can just take a rake and rake it out, and everything would be fine. But if it continues that way, you can end up with these piles that could end up preventing the runoff from getting in. You could end up with erosion and gullies, and it could indicate you're getting more water than the, well, the facility was designed to receive. Um, you might have too steep slopes, or you might need to put some pea gravel down or something to dissipate the flow so that you kind of prevent that erosion. So it's just, again, is it just a simple thing? Was it a large <coughs> storm? Was it Hurricane Sandy or something that did that? And we can just fix it, or do we have some indication of bigger problems? So here's an example of severe inlet erosion, right? This is a it's going to warrant an FBI. This is something that, like, what kind of situation created this gigantic um, undercutting of this in inlet? And again, that's where you need to send someone out to figure out what's ha what's changed, or did was it not properly installed originally? Um, and then you might evaluate what kind of inflow protection measures can be incorporated now, because we don't want to have to dig up the whole facility, um, but just whatever kind of fixes can be implemented to improve the functioning of the facility. So the third indicator we're looking at is pretreatment. So um, in our kind of past and minor situations, we've got pretreatment. And you know, either one is kind of operating as it's supposed to, and it's free of sediment and debris, or maybe this one's got a little bit of sand and sediment accumulating in it, but that's good because that's it's operating as designed. It's supposed to capture the sediment from the drainage area so that it doesn't clog the entire facility. And that's a lot easier to deal with, right, cleaning out the pretreatment than having to completely redo the facility. So a moderate situation, again, we've got a bunch more sediment in this situation, so that's an indication of a future 
bad problem. So here's our FBI here. So much sediment has gotten into the facility that it's completely clogged the filter bed and it's not going to be taking water as indicated by the standing water. And I, I understand sometimes these are a little hard to see um, on the screen. And again, each one of these pictures with the numeric triggers is called out in bioretention illustrators. I'm actually going to pass that around. I just request that we get it back. But it'll give you an idea of if you want to go to that section where all the pictures are, it'll give you an idea of what we're talking about. <clears throat> so that was the fourth indicator in the inlet zone. Um, oh, I'm sorry. This is the fourth Structural integrity. So again, you need to look at the curbs and any of the other um, hard structures that are incorporated as part of a, um, of your bioretention. So here's an example of where your curbs and gutter and everything looks like it's in pretty good condition. Um, I would argue that this is actually an FBI situation because that's um, you're you're about to have a major problem with that parking lot. Yeah, I think we're going to have a car going into the uh, bioretention. <laughs> So we're gonna figure out why that's happening. You know, was it a matter of insulation issues or is it erosion as a result of flow? This is another FBI situation. You know, here we're again we're looking at the curb and gutter around the facility, um, and it's obviously being compromised right at the storm drain. So we're out of the inlet zone. Those were the four that we looked at in the inlet. Now we're getting into the perimeter zone. So one thing we really want to take a look at with the bioretention is the surface area. And does it match the original design? So you can see in this schematic we kind of just made, okay, so here we, we see this is how big it is. And again, you're going to have to compare it to your as built or your site plans. And this is what the original design is. And, you know, the different triggers that we assigned is, is there like a 5% different from the design? That's not a big deal. A 10% different from design, well, that could be a big deal. You might need to do a couple things. But more than 25% different from design, you're going to have some major problems. Um, again, it was designed for a certain amount of water based on a certain drainage area. If you reduce the size of the facility, it can't handle the same amount of water. And you're going to end up with more of those um, high maintenance tasks that need to be dealt with on a more regular basis. You're going to have more erosion in the facility, it's going to be getting more sediment it's not going to be able to handle all sorts of things like that. So you're going to have to do a topographic survey. Or you're going to have to make other changes as needed. Our sixth indicator is um, side slope erosion. This one's really important because, again, with these facilities, we're looking at how they can remove nutrients and sediment from our local waterways, you know, from the stormwater runoff. Well, if our facility is a source of sediment, that's really a bad approach. So any erosion that's happening on the side slope means that that sediment is then getting into the facility as well. Another source that could, again, eventually clog the facility. So here's a, a great example of the side slopes completely covered in turf, so they're in great condition. And I will say, we'll talk about this in a little bit, but turf is the way to go. You really want ground cover versus mulch because ground cover is a lot cheaper to manage in the long term than mulch is. Um, so obviously on this side, we've got some erosion occurring as the water fl sheet flows down the sides into the facility. Um, again, what is this a function of? Is it that our slopes are too steep maybe? Or maybe we could add some pea gravel or other um, erosion preventing mechanisms. Um, this could be a potential, uh, like will end up being an FBI at some point if it's not dealt with. Could you just add some vegetative cover and spot reseeding to um, make sure that it's prevented? Here's a moderate situation. It's a little hard to see, but you've actually got like bulls and really uh, rills and gullies forming down the edge of the side slopes because there's so much water coming at such a force and it's just eroding that down. And again, it's all going to end up in the bed of the facility. So potential options there a lot more vegetation right now. We basically have these hills of mulch and then an individual plant. <coughs> but if they had a better ground cover, like in this situation, it might be okay. But the slopes could just be too steep to do anything about it with vegetation. Here's an example of that severe side slope problem. We've got really steep slopes and no vegetation. 
and you're going to have to do some serious design repair because you can see where you've got these little gorges happening and all that sediment ends up on the bed of the facility. Another thing we want to look at is the ponding volume. The goal of these facilities, right, we want to bring that water in and then we want it to be utilized in the entire facility. We don't want it to go in and then out because then the water is not actually being treated. So here's a great example of how it's supposed to operate. The water goes in and then it, you know, is utilized throughout the entire facility, filters down, the vegetation takes it up, and then it goes out. If there's an overflow event, it just goes out. Um, in this picture, you can see that there's like a crack and the water is actually going underneath. So it's not getting the full ponding. I'm sure during a larger flow event, you're getting more ponding, but there's still some sneaking out. Down here, water comes in and goes out. There is no real ponding and there's no uptake by vegetation. So we're not getting a whole lot of treatment there. And then I think my personal favorite, but I'm gonna let you guys tell me what's wrong with this one. And anyone, in terms of ponding volume, does anyone have any ideas as to why this facility was maybe not well done? Pretty big parking lot for that little small It's a really big parking lot for such a small space. I mean, we can see the stains of the water where it's not going in the facility, it's going out of the facility. Yes, Donna? Soil's too high, it's mounded too high, there's no depression. It's upgrade from the drainage, so the water's not actually going in and going anywhere. It's kind of like, on the high point. Right. And it's very common. So there's no ponding happening and it's not, you know, it's not actually capturing any water. All right, so now we're in the bed zone. So we're going to be taking a look at the sinking filter bed. Stinking? Sinking. Just kidding. <laughs> Might be stinking too. Um, in spring, right? Okay, so here's a great example of, this is a good bioretention. Water flows in off the parking lot, goes over the pea gravel, so we're not causing any erosion. We do have a lot of mulch going on, but we're going to assume it's relatively, it's been relatively recently installed, and they just haven't built up that ground cover yet. Um, and it looks like it's in pretty good condition. Here we've got some minor sinking happening, and right at the edge. So the water's coming in, and that's their pretreatment. And then we've got, you know, obviously there was not, there wasn't supposed to be quite such a jump where the water would come down. And we know that if there's a bigger jump, then we're probably gonna end up with erosion down the road, which we wanna avoid. Down there, um, it's hard to see, but there are big sinkholes, and they're all in a line through the facility. It's like a big hole, and then you go a little bit further, and a big hole, and it's in a perfect line. So that's kind of an indication that there might be something going on with the underdrain, because the underdrain is that big pipe that goes through the facility, and any sinking, that's happening on the bed is probably happening at different parts above the underdrain. That could mean that there's a break in the underdrain, and I'll show you a schematic in a minute. Um, and then a lot of times you can have um, severe bed sinking at where the different structures meet. So that underdrain and the outlet structure, and so that indicates that there might be a break right there. Because if the if there's a break in the infrastructure, the sediment will then go down into the infrastructure and out that way. So bed sinking indicates something under the ground is, something bad under the ground is happening. So here's some examples of that. Um, this is like, this is neat. <laughs> this is some serious bed sinking happening. And again, here's an example of where the two structures meet and that's where the bed has gone down. So it's an indication, I think, yeah. Here's a schematic that kind of demonstrates that. So here's a break in the underdrain, and then you've got the soil coming down and it's into it, and that's indicated on the surface by that bed sinking. So some possible remediation or how you can figure this out is by doing a test excavation. You're, you're digging a hole and you're looking down to see if there's been any movement in the soil. Um, you're evaluating for voids, loss of material, filter cloth or um, other failures. So a lot of times the plans call, I think this is more of a problem in Maryland, but I think a lot of times plans call for filter cloth, but it was never intended to separate the filter media and the underdrain, underdrain layer. Um, it was, it ends up clogging that way and then water ends up standing as well. 
So you, one of the things you want to take a look at are the overflow or underdrain and what you're really looking for, and I think it's kind of obvious, but you're looking for any sediment or um, material that's in the underdrain. Now sometimes you can't always see in the underdrain, so here's a picture um, you know, in the outlet structure, where if you're seeing sediment come in the outlet structure, that's an indication it's getting into the underdrain, and so that, that's an indication that there's a major problem with the piping in the facility. Here's some cool toys that can be used if, if you're trying to figure out what's wrong with the facility. Um, these are CCTV cameras, which can be run up the pipe and look for any cracks and other um, opportunities for media to get in there. We're going to talk about these in the nutrient <coughs> discharges from gray infrastructure session, which is basically a long name for IDDE, because that's also a technique that can be used in finding where discharges get into the storm drain system. And a lot of times, what did I learn? A lot of times, um, the, the sanitary sewer people have those. So you can maybe work with other departments and borrow their pool tools. Um, again, still in the bed zone, our ninth indicator is sediment deposition and caking. So again, we've talked about this. The water needs to get into the facility, it needs to go down. But if it, we have, if it's clogged on the surface or even deeper, the water's not going to be filtered and it's not going to be treated. And we're not going to get those pollutants that we thought we were. So here's a good um, an example of a facility in good condition. This one, we've got some sediment buildup, but maybe it's like two to three inches, so it could just be raked off and just allow for more water to infiltrate. Um, we've got a moderate situation here where this indicates a real source of sediment, again, somewhere, and we can remove the sediment, but we've got to dig a little bit deeper. We might have to implement other procedures, like adding pretreatment to a facility that doesn't already have it, and or looking for the source of the sediment in the contributing drainage area. Here's a case of a severe caking and sedimentation. Um, this facility is done. <laughs> it's going to be, it's going to need to be completely dug up and add all new filter media to this. And that's going to be a very expensive operation. So if we can catch it earlier, at an earlier stage, that's going to, and you know, do something about it, that's going to be a lot better. Um, yeah. Another thing we want to take a look for is standing water. In a bioretention facility, and again, we're looking at just a bioretention as an example, we really shouldn't have standing water in the facility after 48, 72 hours. It should drain. Um, so here's a nice bioretention. There's no water standing. Saturated soils is a, a minor. It kind of indicates that water has been standing a little bit of time. So maybe we have a problem down the road. Moderate, we've got pockets of water pooling, so the rest of the facility has drained, but in certain pockets we have standing water. And again, that's an indication that something else is going on. And then obviously, any facility that's got standing water after 72 hours entirely has essentially failed. And we have to figure out why. And so you would proceed to the pump down and test pit to figure out what the problem is. So here's some examples. Uh, just more pictures of test pits as well. Um, but you're looking to investigate when you do have standing water, some of the culprits, you want to investigate the mulch, the soil media. We're looking again for filter cloth if it's there. Um, we find that a lot actually. Sometimes the underdrain, there's an issue with, an un with the underdrain or the stone layer. And then again, you're looking for evidence of sediment that could be causing this. Our 11th indicator we're looking for is the ponding depth. So we talked about the ponding volume and making sure that the um, water is being used throughout the entire facility, but also these facilities, and what is it in the, in the Pennsylvania Stormwater Manual? Is it like 12 inches that you design a bioretention to have to pond? Six. Six inches? Okay. So we just want to make sure that we're actually getting that storage that um, it was originally designed for, that it's not coming in and maybe ponding three inches and then finding its way out. So basically, I only have two examples for this that have a good condition, and then I have a severe condition where you are not getting that ponding volume because the water flows out before it has the opportunity to pond to the depth that it was supposed to. Now we need to look at um, the mulch depth and condition. So I said earlier that the goal is to get ground cover, because that 
It's going to, you know, it's going to remove nutrients because you've got vegetation. Um, it's going to be less costly to maintain over the long run. You don't have to keep replenishing. Um, but it's really important that the people maintaining the facility understand the function of the facility and that you have that six inches um, of depth to allow for the ponding. And they don't fill it in with six inches of mulch. Which So in this example, you can see our friends saw that this was 10 inches of mulch. So this facility was designed for a 12 inch ponding volume or ponding depth. And um, it was basically filled in. Whoever was maintaining it said, oh look, this is a big pit. Let's just fill it in with mulch. So it wasn't getting the removal that they hoped. In some of these other examples, you can see, you know, again, the water's running into the facility and it's moving the mulch around. And we already talked about how that can lead to erosion or prevent the water from coming in. Um, again, in this moderate example, which, you know, maybe could be an FBI, we really have the, the level of mulch is hindering the ability of the stormwater runoff to actually get into the facility. And you see, as we go through these indicators, there's like overlap overlap between the inlet and the mulch, erosion, and the condition of the bed. Trash, we're looking to make sure that these facilities don't have a lot of trash. Or if they do capture a lot of trash, like in this example, which is from Baltimore City, we understand there's a lot of trash in the contributing drainage area. Just that that trash gets cleaned out so that it doesn't end up blocking the inlet or blocking the outlet or things like that. It's a pretty easy one. Okay. Still in the bed zone, this is bed erosion, but I think we're close to being out. Um, what we're really looking for here is how the water moves through the facility once it gets in. So some of the problems, um, sometimes I think it works, it makes sense to work from the severe category backwards. So in this situation, you have so much water coming through the facility that has created a channel. And so it's causing erosion that's contributing to the pollutants that the facility has to deal with, which will, could ultimately clog it through the filter media. It is, um, it's not allowing for that water to use throughout the entire facility because it's just being run through the channel. Um, so here are some other examples of less severe bed erosion occurring. You can see here some erosion of, as, as the water moves through the facility. Again, as it comes in through the inlet, it's starting to be channelized, which ultimately will lead to a situation like that. So some potential options, you want to make sure you disperse the flow so it doesn't come in, kind of like this fire hose coming into the facility. And wreak havoc, break it out to make sure that whatever channels have been formed can be um, get back to the way it's supposed to be. Investigate the source, like why is this happening? Are we getting more water than we originally anticipated? Is it a problem with the inlet? Is it, too, is it designed too small to, so that it's kind of focusing the water like a spigot? Um, do we need a pretreatment mechanism? All right, now we're out of the bed zone. <laughs> Moving on. So <laughs> now we're going to look at vegetation, which, as Tom said earlier, um, isn't always every engineer's favorite thing. Um, it's, a li it's also a little bit different than some of the more um, structural components to the bioretention that we've been talking about because it is dynamic. It changes over time, right? So what you originally designed the facility to have, it may not be what you ultimately have. And then, you know, how bad is that? Sometimes it's okay, sometimes it's not. Um, it your maintenance level really depends on the landscaping regime you're going for. And so what we're really gonna look at what we're going to use to assess the vegetation is the vegetation cover, because again, it's really important to have the bio and bioretention. We want to make sure there's vegetation. The condition of the vegetation, make sure it's alive. Um, and then the vegetative maintenance, because, um, you know, it might be a little bit overgrown. So here's an example of the same facility over 10 years. So you can see in year one, the vegetation and then it's growing in year three, and then year 10, what the vegetation looks like. And the idea is that the original design plan should kind of specify the desired plant community throughout the life of the facility as much as possible. Um, and then you're gonna use a different um, maintenance regime or landscaping regime based on the situation 
you're in, right? So if a facility is at the back of a big subdivision and nobody can see it, you're probably going to use different plants than if you use something, you know, than if for a facility that's kind of in a high visibility, high traffic area. Um, so here's an example of a bioretention designed for the perennial garden. Um, this one is a perennial shrub mixture. Um, this is a tree shrub mulch approach, which, um, you know, has less mowing, but again, that mulch is a little bit more expensive to maintain on an ongoing basis. And then here's a turf tree situation. So how you maintain and how you inspect them really kind of depends on what your original approach was. Something that's really important is when you're assessing the vegetation in a bioretention or any of these facilities, you want to do it during the growing season. If you wait, if you do it in the winter, it's really hard to tell if the vegetation is doing well. Um, if you do it in the summer, it can be really overgrown and it's hard to see what else is going on in the facility. We went to one and we were covered in burrs when we left <laughs> and we were trying to dig through to see what the bed was like. Um, so looking at those three <coughs> different indicators in the vegetation category, we're looking again at the cover. Um, do we have a good cover condition? You saw that picture already. Um, do we have a couple bare spots? Like the vegetation looks pretty good, but we do, we can still see the bed and there's some, there are some bare spots there. Um, or, or in this case, which is a, a pretty bad situation, we have less than 75% coverage. So we're not getting those um, benefits that the vegetation actually provides. We've got um, more exposed area, which will lead to a higher maintenance cost. And here's a tip to routinely split, routinely split and replant the herbaceous material to reduce the mulch area, as we talked about. Here's an example of a severe, a couple severe vegetative cover situations. And basically, what happened here is the vegetation, the, the vegetation that was originally um, called for in these plants was not right for the facility or right for the specific site. Another thing we want to take a look at is vegetative condition. Are our plants alive and in good condition? Do we need a little bit of weeding? Um, does it matter? That might be um, something that a, a, a locality will determine on their own, like what level of maintenance is needed. Because some we weeds remove weeds as well. Um, here's some examples of some severe situations. We've got less than 35% coverage or dead and diseased plants. Why is that? Are they not the right plants for the right situation? Because they need to in a bioretention, they need to be able to be dry sometimes, and they also need to be able to handle some standing water for at least two days. Um, so we gotta figure out what is the cause of the plant failure? Is it the soil? Is it the plant species? Was it the design of the facility? And so on and so forth and do a new planting plan as needed, maybe incorporate different plants. And then finally, we're just inspecting what level of maintenance the facility gets. And I, again, I think that, you know, that's really site specific and locality specific, you know, what level of maintenance you want to dictate. You just really want to make sure that it's still operating as originally designed um, and can provide you with the benefits. This is a, um, this is my favorite picture, I think. This picture is actually from downtown Seattle, where they do a lot of those street bioretentions. And you wouldn't believe it, but this is a very urban area. This man is literally on the other side of where all the parked cars are and the street is. And that's how overgrown this facility is. And he actually had a machete to get in there. And that was not on our tools, but we maybe should add that to our tools page. All right, we're on our last visual indicator for bioretention. You made it. We're looking again at the underdrain, and we kind of touched on this earlier when we were talking about bed sinking and filter media and everything, but we really want to make sure that the underdrain is free of obstructions and debris, and that's, I mean, it's pretty obvious because we want it to be able to drain any water, but then also if it's not, if it has sediment, that's an indication that something else is wrong. You know, maybe the underdrain has a pro uh, break in it, or maybe the filter media is getting through the pea gravel layer <laughs> and actually getting into the underdrain. So we're looking again for bed sinking and doing a test pit to see what could be the problem. 
So all these visual indicators, I, I hope I convey that, they really build off of each other. So that's why I think it is very, I think it is possible to do this in a 30 minute inspection. Because, you know, we looked at, we're looking at the underdrain, we're also looking for bed sinking at the same time. So we can kind of mentally check, check, we got both of those. Does that make sense? So before we go on to the next part of what we're gonna be talking about, I just wanna check in with everyone and see what you think of this visual approach to inspection? Do you have questions? No? Yeah. I'll just uh, add uh, one or two points to Sue's fine presentation. Uh, the visual indicators, you know, we tend to think of inspection you know, for the regulatory purposes, but um, we want our maintainers to have that same exact notion of go back to the one on the um, overgrown, yeah, that, that's fine. That essentially the people that are doing, the landscape contractors who are doing maintenance and bioretention, um, they see the trees uh, in the upper right hand side and they go, maybe not this time, but the next time I'm going to have to thin out six of those trees so it's not as bushy as it is. Or you know, earlier on she showed uh, the mulch is not, it is completely gone and it's not covered. It's time to add mulch. And so by getting them to understand how bioretention works and what is good bioretention and bad bioretention, they can prescribe maintenance and perform maintenance. You know, they can get the rakes, rake out the mulch, and do it very quickly, but they have to know what to do to make it a function. And then when it's really not working, yeah, call in the engineer, but the, the value, I think, of this approach is to get people to understand when it's time to maintain a facility and what to maintain. Mm -hmm. Because engineers don't know a lot about, for example, plants. And no one might remember what the planting plan was, but it's not really bushy. So getting the public has some expectation of the level of service we're providing. For the, uh, and it's the so what factor. So if it's bushy, so what? But as long as it's not preventing the facility from functioning as it's supposed to. Well, um, so I think I mentioned this earlier. We developed, we did something similar. I think the manual is making its way around, hopefully. I think you guys have seen it. Um, so in the appendices, <laughs> Okay. Um, in the appendices, there are the other the other visual indicators, the other LID practices. We've done permeable pavement, grass swales, filter strips, infiltration, um, and basically, you'll see we've got the numeric triggers. We've got a description of what indicator you're looking at, um, what you're looking for, and then some pictures of basically the bad bad examples, um, because I think. Sometimes the bad examples help you understand the objective of the indicator. So here's an example of the indicators that were outlined for permeable pavement. Again, you can revise it as you see fit. But I just wanted to show with this that we've got 12 different indicators, and obviously some of them are going to be similar, and some of them are going to be different. We don't want standing water and permeable pavement, so it's not that permeable. Um, but obviously a flow test is not something you're doing with a bioretention necessarily. But it just shows here at what stage in that flow chart that we're looking at these indicators. So it's the project acceptance stage, routine maintenance stage. We don't need to do a flow test every time we do routine maintenance of permeable case. That doesn't make any sense. The verification stage, um, or what you know, is this something that we're really investigating during that more intense investigation? So again, we did it for those four other LID practices. Um, here's an example of the indicators for infiltration practices. And I highlighted in red just the indicators we're really looking at during the routine maintenance or inspections. That's really what we're taking a look at. Cross channels. And then with that, I mean, I think one thing we did was we didn't put it in a memo but as part of the PowerPoint, we decided, well, can we take the same visual approach with stormwater ponds? With that, I'll turn that over to Tom.
Um, yeah, the uh, same basic approach works uh, for stormwater ponds, although I'd say you, know, you end up with a little bit longer checklist for the reasons I outlined earlier. But you have to worry about dam safety and so forth. But uh, we have a lot of older ponds. Some are dry, some are dry extended detention, some are wet ponds, some are constructed wetlands. But they have, uh, in general, the same visual <coughs> indicators uh, and we'll go through those in a little bit more detail. Um, the other key thing that I would mention is as you're doing these in your community, it sometimes is a great opportunity uh, to find your bad facilities and identify them for retrofitting, uh, to bring them up to speed. So when you do that, you not only get rid of an eyesore and a maintenance problem issue, but you're able to meet your uh, pollutant reduction requirements. So this is just a list of the uh, things that were shown visually. Um, and again, as Cecilia noted, uh, some may not apply uh, to all uh, ponds, but these are pretty much pretty common. So the first uh, thing we look at is the inflow pipes into the pond, and most ponds have more than one, so we have to kind of hunt around the perimeter. Uh, we're looking to um, see if there's any scour, whether the corrugated metal pipe is corroded. Very common issue with uh, older st stormwater ponds of any kind, if they have corrugated metal pipe, it lasts about 25 years, and after that, it's beginning to fail. So if you have a three-decade-old pond, it's probably beginning. And then you look for blockage. But here's actually one, it's actually at the construction stage, it's set at the right elevation, no scour, it's concrete, and no blockage. So that would be the pass, and then move on to the next uh, outlet. The second thing about ponds is we want to uh, make sure that we have equipment access at least to the uh, embankment uh, and the riser. So uh, and that just means, and this is the difference between LID practices and ponds. Ponds at some point in the future will need to be dredged or maintained or require heavy equipment, bush hogs, dredges, all that kind of stuff. Maybe 25, 30 years down the road, uh, but that's their design philosophy. They fill up. So do we have the ability uh, to ease it? Is it wide enough to get down there? Uh, has people planted uh, rose bushes and other vegetation? Uh, is it too steep? Uh, is it blocked by fences? Or the thing we often see in Maryland is there's a lock there to the gate so you can't get in, but no one in the community has the key. It's just gone. So. But then you know, once you uh, break the lock, then every kid in the neighborhood is going to you know, go there and do nefarious activities. Uh, four bay, uh, this is a good looking four bay. Uh, not all ponds have them, uh, so you just know absent or present. Uh, four bays will generally get uh, filled up somewhere between five and ten years, and that's their purpose. The idea is that it's the one area where the sediment drops out, you can get to it and preserve the second part of the cell so it lasts long. Uh, it's the area where you'll see the most trash and debris, and you also want to make sure that there's adequate flow conveyance from the four bay to the main uh, pool cell. And this is uh, uh, an example of uh, with FBI, they've gone there and realized half of the four bay is full. And so they, uh, in this case, uh, have done a number of things. They're dewatering the facility and putting it to a, uh, a vegetated area. And now they're bringing in the equipment to uh, remove the trap sediments and apply them. Um, in this case, I think it was a land application. Ponds are supposed to have benches for safety on the uh, inside perimeter and outside perimeter of the pool. Uh, you're looking to make sure they're there, uh, the vegetative condition, and just like with bioretention, uh, you want to see whether there's any erosion on that zone. 
And the pool elevation and capacity is the fifth thing we look at. And this is where it really is helpful to have uh, plants. Because uh, you can't always tell unless you've really experienced whether it is too high or too low or at the right exact level. Uh, but if you have the plans, a high pool indicates a clogged outfall <coughs> or incorrect design, sometimes a perched water table. The low pool is very wor worrisome. It either means that the uh, seal underneath is broken or there is seepage through the embankment, which is a big liability issue. So the two conditions, I don't like either, but a, uh, a low pool is more of a liability issue. And then this one here is uh, what I would consider a flag in that you get what I call the dirty bathtub effect. <laughs> That's because it's going up and down, up and down to the level that even despite the fact that it's uh, been around for a couple of years, vegetation can't grow because you know, there's very few plants in the world that can Tidal plants can, but how many tidal areas are there in Pennsylvania? Here. Oh no, that's not true. Philadelphia is on the nest area, right? <coughs> but that's not in the Chesapeake Bay watershed, so we don't care about it. So we don't care about it. <laughs> <laughs> we got the wrong bay to worry about. <laughs> um, and so we're looking, this is the whole purpose. We're going through this quickly. We see a pool that, in this case, uh, is much higher than it should be. We're just flagging that and saying, okay, send the, the experienced engineer to figure out what's going on and do the testing to see whether it's just a simple matter, in this case, of where the low flow orifice is completely clogged by a plastic bag. And, um, or I've seen quite a few that were uh, sediment control ponds and they never opened them up when they were doing. One of the interesting things that we see across all BMPs is how design influences, bad design influences future maintenance problems. Cecilia was showing you all those you know, side slope problems of bioretention. And that's because people like to do you know, any design manual. It's three to one slopes. We all know that three to one slopes are not that stable uh, given up when you're running water over. Well, here's a case of two knucklehead designs, and they're not in Pennsylvania, so no one in this room is responsible. <laughs> but here is to save one length of pipe. This design decided daylight is outfall up here, and then create a 10 foot vertical drop over 25 feet and up. We'll just throw some riprap down there. There were seven of these around the pond. Four of them worked like a charm. Three became huge gullies and, and the whole thing undercut and created major maintenance problems. Had those been put at the same elevation, that last length of pipe, uh, so that they're at the same elevation, you don't get that hydraulic jump that's truly noted in bioretention. Two different BMPs, but we're creating this fall uh, and we know enough about water that when we create fall, we create problems. And so as a design reviewer, construction inspector, whatever, when we see those problems, um, and here's just another one. Uh, we have steep slopes, and this is in Montgomery County, Maryland. So they decided they were going to fence ponds for liability reasons. And they put the fence halfway around it, or, I mean, around the entire thing, but halfway up the side slope. But here it's so steep that they can't maintain vegetation. And if you're in charge of maintenance, if they had vegetation, how could they move? <laughs> how can they get inside this fence? And so that's again as a um, one of the great tools of these visual indicators is by seeing what doesn't work, it really informs you as a plan reviewer or working on design specifications. Uh, embankment integrity, um, that call is usually made by an engineer, uh, but 
These are common problems that we see. Trees on the embankment, a no-no. Sloughing, a no-no. Uh, burrows, we have a lot of uh, woodchucks, is that what you're talking about here, or? Grass grizzlies. Grass grizzlies. <laughs> yeah. <All right. laughs> yeah, that guy didn't do a good job this year up at Poxatucky or whatever his mm -hmm. name is. He's still so um, It's least, all the interpretation. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> uh, all I know is I, around March, whenever I saw a, a groundhog, I felt like veering my car over and running away. But things on the downside of the embankment, any seepage, moist areas on the toe is a sign, and voids or moisture around the barrel. The barrel is the pipe that goes through the embankment. So anytime we see any moisture on the outside, uh, that tells us we have a potential problem. And the point is, we can have an intern or a summer student or a college uh, fresh out go and look for these things if they find them, we dispatch the engineer to tell us whether it's a real big issue. And so, you know, is this a make or break issue to have a few trees on the embankment? And, and why do people not like trees on the embankment? Someone asked me that, and I had to go back and look at my old files. And it's a very simple reason. The root system. The root system, but uh, it, Usually the root system is not, because embankments are so compacted that they're not going to spill them. The re reason for the concern is what happens to trees when they get old. So if these got real big and they fell down, that's when you get, and of course, when do trees usually fall down? Big storm events. When the pond is doing it. So, you know, in this fevered engineer's mind, this is like the worst case scenario. And that's why engineers hate trees. <laughs> okay, short end of that story. Um, eighth area is every pond should have uh, an outflow pipe or a drain, just as we had in vital retention. So the nice thing about ponds are that we can actually see the pipe in most cases. So we open the riser, um, <clears throat> we look for the pond drain, and this is the, the main outfall and we look for situations like this. Um, and it's pretty common, you know, I'd say 5% of facilities clog in any given year uh, of wet ponds. And dry ponds, dry extended retention ponds, I'd say 10 to 15% in any given year are going to be in the hall of shame. <laughs> um, short circuiting is another issue. and. Um, Here's the inflow, here's the outflow. So remember how she was talking about pond uh, volume. volume? So it's distributed over the thing. That's why this makes it work. If it takes three nanoseconds to transit through the facility, we're not going to get the treatment. Well, the other thing about it is, look at the pipe for a second. The kind of, this is about a 25-year-old design back when they, I think they, secretly felt they wanted to design rockets. <laughs> they did neat things like little steps to get out to the area you can't have access to. That was an inspired engineering design. <laughs> think about it, you look at it for a second, you go, know, what was he thinking? Or she. Although back then, there were very few female engineers, so most of the knucklehead designs are associated with this. But you look at this, it has a unique coloring. Why might it have that color? It's the staining that shows that for about mm -hmm. six months it was clogged, nobody maintained it. And then the thing with uh, maintenance and uh, these problems, when you get to that severe stage, okay, now it's pounded to a depth of three or four feet. Uh, all the you can't mow the grass, the vegetation grows up. So now the facility, we have to go out and bush hog it. We have to do some kind of, you know, to bring it back into compliance, it's a major issue. And um, my colleague, Ted Scott, and I talk a lot about it. A lot of people are fearful, fearful of LID for all the reasons. You know, she showed a lot of bad slides, but most of those can be done with hand tools. 
when you get into serious problems like this, you're talking you know, 25,000, 50,000, you need more to do a corrective action. We all know that that kind of coin is not in our in local budgets. All right, just a few more. The barrel and the riser. Um, I mentioned earlier about corrugated metal pipe, so here are some uh, great examples of that. This is actually my little brother, Tim. Very nice guy. <laughs> um, I used to say he's single, but he's not. So. Um, but here we have an exposed joint, so it's leaking here. Here the corrugated metal pipe has uh, seeded its useful life. Here we have um, seepage around the barrel because we have, um, again, four connections. So if you think about it, this is just like the underdrain pictures that Cecilia was showing you, except they're 36 inches, 48 inches in diameter. And you know, often you may not need those little toys that she was talking about. You can, I don't know if she can crawl in there. I don't think you can I crawl do. in there. Confined yeah. space. And then here are other things just to, um, I kind of think it's like caving. Going into some of these facilities, you find unique geological formations. You see these kind of cracks in the riser. Um, when you have leaks in the riser, it creates this gelatinous red and purple stuff. Calcification at the joints is a very common issue. So the way they are exactly like this. Here you see the cracks in the barrel which indicate that um, it's not installed properly. Emergency spillway. Uh, this is kind of like the outflow to a bioretention area. It's just a very big one. Um, this is after 15 or 20 years, it's not always clear where they are, so sometimes you find it, have a hard time finding it. But it's essentially the emergency, uh, if, if all the other outflows are clogged up during a huge storm, this is where the water can uh, bypass the pond without the embankment failing. And so it's important, it's a very, it may, needs to be there when that once in a hundred year storm occurs. So you want, of any area of the facility you're looking um, for blockages, tree growth, erosion, and whether it still has its original capacity. So again, we've gone from the inflow, the main cell, the side slopes, we're now at the outfall. And this is an area of common problems that we find erosion on the downstream end, and lo and behold, we have the same issue that Cecilia showed us. We get a little jump. And two inches of jump, not, not a problem. It's trickle of water. Very soothing. Goes with my aromatherapy, <laughs> which I don't know the problems. It's a little bit more returning up, and over time, um, you lose the pipe. So we're looking for things like riprap displacement, early signals of that. Um, and here's a great example. That little stuff is now like a foot and a half. So now it's getting worse. And then I've been back to this site. The pipe is now, that section of the pipe is in the stream. Um, so the last area we're looking is the downstream channel, the pipe undercutting, uh, and the downstream channel stability because the, um, and then uh, we're looking at vegetation. Um, here are just some examples, you know, and I would say I could probably find numerous ones of these. I'll say when I've done work in Lancaster, I'm sure you all are much better than water counties. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But if you kind of say, where is the ponds in my community? Well, there's several diagnostic things. Usually there's an old chain link fence that is all these vines that have overgrown it. Inside there's a bunch of willows and water and other things that we don't know. And if you're fresh on the job, you go, is it a wet pond, a dry pond, a structure wet? And you have no idea, except that no one in the community wants it. Um, and so, 
what I like to kind of conclude, I'll show a couple more pictures, is that this and this are our opportunities where we've gotten this MS4 permit stuff and we're nervous about it, but uh, over time we can take these community eyesores, make them function as designed, and our community, you know, they probably don't give a about the Chesapeake Bay. Some of them may, may not have ever been you know, had blue crabs, which is their problem. But uh, <laughs> they want to have uh, a nice community. They don't want uh, ticks. They don't want mosquitoes. They don't want uh, an unsafe area for their kids. So they retrofitting them and maintaining them so they perform. Um, and I'll stop there because I think we're close to lunchtime. But we are. The purpose of all this visual inspection outside is to bore you to complete tears over the last hour and a half. Oh, awesome. Sorry. <laughs> uh, it's a lot. Is, is that once we see stormwater and know what is good and what is bad, once we teach that to others, then we have the ability to make earlier interventions to keep that infrastructure working. And if we put it off for 20 years, and kind of concluded in all these ponds where they built it according to spec, they got their approvals, the minute it was done, the developer walked away, the owner had no idea what it is, 25 years of neglect, it's not functioning for its original purpose, it becomes a liability for us in a larger sense. And so we have to go in the retro. And it's a, uh, stop there for now. Um, so we're going to have lunch. I'll leave it to you to explain how we will eat. And uh, just does anyone have any questions on that session? Come on. You're just afraid to ask questions because you don't want to hold us with the food. Huh? You don't want to jeopardize lunch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the food has been